Well, good morning, Briggs Road. It's great to see you here. Good morning, Briggs Road. Good morning, our guests. It's great to see you all here today. And uh, my name is Ray Humphrey. So I, I, we had our new members fellowship today, so I'm wearing a, a name tag. And uh, I, I didn't even think, you know, I'm, uh, Katrina and I, I'm, I'm the pastor, and of course she's my wife. We're new members too, so uh, <laughs> we get to be welcomed as well today. So I'm wearing my name tag. So <laughs> um, turn with me, if you will, to the book of Nehemiah. Book of Nehemiah, chapter 2. Last week, we looked in the book of Nehemiah, and we saw um, that Nehemiah stood before the king of Persia, and he stated his case, and he stated uh, the plan of God for his people to come back and rebuild the wall in Jerusalem. And this week, I want to look at how Nehemiah brought this plan to God's people. And so you're going to see sort of a progression. We started off and we saw how God birthed the vision in Nehemiah's heart. Then we saw how it was revealed from Nehemiah to the king. And now we're going to see how the vision gets from Nehemiah to the people. And I'm excited today to look into the Word of God. So let's begin reading here in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 11. And we're going to look at some things this morning. The first thing I want to notice in our text is I want to notice from Nehemiah that leaders develop the plan by gathering facts. Now this plan that God has birthed in Nehemiah's heart, this vision to rebuild the walls in Jerusalem, I want you to notice Nehemiah does not immediately go back home and give this to all of the people. However, Nehemiah goes back first and he begins to gather information. Let's read here beginning in verse 11. So I went to Jerusalem... And was there three days. Then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me, and I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me but the one on which I rode. I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring and to the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire." Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. Then I went up in the night by the valley and inspected the wall. And I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing. And I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work." And so we're reading about Nehemiah here, and we read that when he comes back, it's, it's about a two-month journey from Persia back to Jerusalem. Uh, he'd been journeying for some time now, and he gets there, and he's, he's, his first order of business is not to go straight to the people of God, not to go straight to the people living in Jerusalem, not to go straight to the Jews and say, this is what we must do. His first order of business now keep in mind, Nehemiah has been miles and miles and miles away in, in Persia. And he's not been at home. He has heard from others what the situation is with the walls and the vulnerability of Jerusalem. But now he comes himself and he surveys the wreckage and he gets boots on the ground and he develops this plan by gathering facts. And so here he is guided by God. He's already made plans. God has put it in his heart to know what needs to be done. Nehemiah can see it, but he needed to go himself and see the breadth and the width and the length of the problem. And so what I want to see today from Nehemiah is some things about leadership. And if God calls you into ministry, He calls you into leadership. If God calls you to serve, I believe He calls us all to develop somewhat as leaders. And so I want to see what God's leaders do when they are following God's plan. So Nehemiah, he goes to the source. And, and we read here the details of where he goes, the gates that he surveys, and the areas of the walls that he looks at. And the, the route that he goes and how he goes with just a few people and the, and the animal on which he's riding. Now, why would he do this? Because Nehemiah, surveying the scene up close, 
gives Nehemiah specific answers to questions that he's going to receive. Now, suppose he had gone straight to the people and said, here's what we're going to do, here's what we need to do. And somebody says, well, Nehemiah, have you, have you seen the wall? He said, well, I've not really seen the walls. Uh, have, you seen, have you seen the wreckage over on the eastern side and how bad it is there? Well, no, I've not actually looked at it yet. But by Nehemiah going and looking and giving attention and learning what is the situation, he's able to formulate in his mind between him and God what needs to be done, what's the greatest priority, and what needs attention. And this is what leaders do. This is what God's people do when they are embarking on a great work. They do their due diligence. They pray before God, but they know the situation. As in, as in the Scriptures, we read about the men of Issachar who were wise men who knew the times, who knew what Israel ought to do. Folks, it is very dangerous to begin working even for God if we do not have the right information. It's very dangerous to begin working and doing something, especially at great expenditure and great effort, if we have not counted the cost. Jesus gives a parable of the man who would not count the cost of building a tower, and He says He wouldn't be able to finish it. And before we embark on a great work of God, we embark by faith and we begin by faith, but we must also begin with knowledge, knowing what God has given us to know. So Nehemiah goes and he surveys and he looks and he sees what can be learned. The book of Proverbs chapter 24, verses 3 and 4 tell us this, By wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established. By knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. The book of Proverbs puts a high priority on knowledge and on wisdom. And we're told there by the writer of Proverbs that a house is built by wisdom. That's not what you would expect. You would expect to say a house is built by labor. A house is built by wealth. A house is built by expertise. But no, Proverbs tells us a house is built by wisdom and by understanding. And its rooms are filled with riches through knowledge. If we're going to build, if we're going to labor, we must build and we must labor with the knowledge that we need that God gives us. So I want you to notice here, Nehemiah processes information before he provides instruction. Notice here in the text, verse 12, he says, I arose in the night, I and a few men with me. He keeps the circle as close as he can. He doesn't, he doesn't involve everybody in the work he doesn't involve everybody in what he's doing, and he's going by night. He's going in secret. He's keeping his plan secret. He's keeping his plan close. He's keeping the lid on it. And notice he says, I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. Then again in verse 16 you read, And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, and I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. It's no coincidence, folks, that Jesus spent the first 30 years of his life in obscurity preparing for a three and a half year ministry. The Apostle Paul, when he was called by God to be an apostle, he tells us that he did not at first talk to other people, but he went for about three years and he spent time alone with God in the wilderness learning and listening to God. When God called Moses to do a great work for him to set the people of Israel free, he called him at the, at, the, at the prime age of 80 years old after he had learned many hard lessons, after he'd spent 40 years in Egypt and spent 40 years in obscurity. And you see, folks, God does not call us to work in a fervor and, and to work in just a, an all-out Mad dash, God calls us to have a settled, self-controlled mind that evaluates the facts, that evaluates the information, that builds a house by wisdom. That builds a house by wisdom. And see, by Nehemiah looking at all of the wreckage, by Nehemiah looking at the city, he can prioritize. He can say, this needs attention first. I'll need more men here. This is the worst part of the work. He can begin to conceptualize how long this is going to take. Folks, as a leader, someone who leads, they must have a, 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 an overview of what's going on. And Nehemiah, he can't do all the work himself. He will not be able to. But as the leader of this work, he has to have a bird's eye view of what's going on. And leaders must know what's going on and under their leadership. 
So he goes first. He internalizes this. And this allows God to develop the plan within Nehemiah's heart before it's revealed to anyone else. The wise leader lets God finish the vision in his heart before he reveals it to others. A half-baked vision will be a short-lived failure. But now there's another reason Nehemiah is not very quick to reveal everything that God's put into his heart. And it's very simple. He keeps the enemy in the dark. We're going to find out the very, in this passage as we go on that there's opposition to the work that Nehemiah is doing. And we're going to go through this book and we're going to see the opposition. We're going to see the tactics of the enemy to shut down the rebuilding efforts. And before Nehemiah says anything, he gets it in his heart and he gets this preliminary work done. Had he begun to, to blabber and to tell this and to spread it abroad, it would have gone throughout the country. The enemies would have heard of it. They would have come and they would have killed it and they would have shut it down. Nehemiah had to keep this close, develop the vision, and then reveal it to the people who needed to hear it to get buy-in before the enemies came in and discouraged people from doing the work. I'll tell you, Satan, if he can, Satan, if he can, will stop great commission work. He will stop the work of God dead in its tracks before it ever gets started. How many times has the church gone to do something and someone come along with some reason why it cannot be done, why it should not be done, why it ought not be done, and nobody takes the risk, takes the forward look and says, here are some reasons why it ought to be done. Satan longs to stop the work of God. And Nehemiah keeps it between himself, between him and God. He prays over it. He learns. He learns what needs to be known. And he gets a bird's eye view of the situation. He processes the information before providing instruction. Proverbs 24, 27 says this, Prepare your work outside. Get everything ready for yourself in the field. And after that, build your house. Last week I talked about how Nehemiah came before the king and he told him uh, what he wanted to do. And at, well, at first it started off, Nehemiah came before the king. The king said, Nehemiah, you're sad. And he said, why are you sad? He said, well, because my homeland is destroyed. My city is vulnerable. He said, well, what do you want to do about it? And he says, well, I want to go back and rebuild the walls. And he says, how long is it going to take? And this is where Nehemiah gives all the details. Remember last week I was talking. When someone wants to start ministry, they want to do leadership, I ask a lot of hard questions. I say, now, why do you want to do this? How, is it, how long is it going to take? What's it going to do? Nehemiah was not a half-baked leader. He did not come in and say, we just need to do this without any regard to the consequences or what it was going to cost. Nehemiah went, he knew what it was going to cost. He knew what it was going to take. He knew more about the situation than anyone else because it had been in his heart. He had boots on the ground and he was there. He knew the situation. So you prepare your work outside. You get everything ready for yourself in the field. And then after that, you build your house. You do the preliminary work, and then you build the house. But I want to notice something else about Nehemiah. He assesses in his planning, what's he doing? Is he just looking and, and trying to be gloomy and trying to get depressed by how bad things are? No. Nehemiah assesses what has been, while at the same time envisioning what will be. You see, anybody can look at rubble and see rubble. Anybody can look at rubble and see rubble. And I mentioned last week, anybody can look at a problem and say, there's the problem. It takes someone who is before God. It takes someone who cares. It takes someone who's doing the work. It takes someone who's looking at the facts. It takes someone who is caring and their heart is broken, however, to see the solution and to see the way that God is leading. So Nehemiah, when he goes through and you read all these details, and, and I even found a map that shows us the city, shows us sort of the route that Nehemiah went, some of the things that he looked at. As Nehemiah is going along and he's going by the valley gate to the dragon spring, to the dung gate, he's looking at these places that used to be landmarks. These aren't just strange names, or, you know, the dung gate. That's, a, that's pretty much what it sounds like, by the way. Uh, that's, where, that's where things went out. of the, they, they took things out. Uh, they inspected the walls of Jerusalem. He's not just looking at these things. These aren't just abstract names. These are places that used to have functions. These are places that used to have purposes. He went to the fountain gate and to the king's pool. In Nehemiah's imagination, God is taking him back to when the city was whole, when it was built, when it was fortified, when it was strong. And when Nehemiah is looking at this wreckage, he's not just seeing wreckage. He's seeing what is supposed to be there. 
He looks and he sees what once had been, what is now destroyed, and what God longs to rebuild. We never need to be pie in the sky, uh, unrealistic in our expectation. But folks, God's people ought to be hopeful people. God's people ought to be visionary people. And rather than look at a situation and say, well, here's the problem, it's never going to be fixed, we need to look and see what God can do and find out how to enable ourselves to do what God is calling us to do. I mentioned a few weeks ago about a man in a church, and they had a youth facility where the youth were meeting. It was an old, it was an old house, and it was falling down, and their youth group had dwindled down to just very little, and Someone said, well, we need a new facility for our youth. And, and he said, well, why would we need that? He said, because we don't have that many youth coming. <laughs> All he could see was the badness. All he could see was the wreckage. All he could see was what had dwindled, and he couldn't see the possibility and the pathway forward. Folks, if in all of our observations and if all, in all of our examinations of our church and our ministries and where we are if all it is is a negative assessment of what is and we can't find the vision to say this is the way forward we have lost our vision we have lost our vision if we have become a static pile of rubble saying this is just reality as it is boy we used to have the valley gate we used to have the king's pool we used to have these things if we don't maintain an aggressive vision that stands in the face of the devil and says god can rebuild that which has fallen down we've lost our vision we've lost our purpose we've lost our passion but nehemiah strolls and before he's told anybody about what god's going to do He's looking and he's envisioning. And the city of Jerusalem was built in Nehemiah's mind. The walls were strong. And he says, I can see it. I can see it. And that's why leaders have to see what doesn't yet exist. Show it to others and bring them along. Nehemiah sees what God can do. Folks, instead of bemoaning the good old days, I've heard it dozens of times, probably hundreds of times from people in churches, and in every church, it's different. Every church, it's different. I know one church that it was maybe back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. And they'd say, man, our youth group was really strong. Man, I'll tell you, it was just... And, and I just hear these stories of the old glory days. Okay? And then, then I've known other churches that are like, yeah, we used to have a choir. Man, we used to have a choir that just everybody wanted to hear our choir. They'd book our choirs for revivals. And I'd hear these stories about what used to be. And I'd hear stories, of, I, I've even heard some churches, their mark of pride was, well, we've always had a pastor with a Ph.D. Man, we've always had, you know, we've always had prestigious pastors or things like that. And I, and I hear this all the time from churches, and they look back and they think about, in their mind, what the high water mark was. And it has turned into just a fond remembrance, a precious memory. And somewhere along the way, we've gotten comfortable saying, well, those days are gone. They can't be recovered. And folks, let me tell you, we're not here to recover the past. We're here to be faithful in the future. Okay? We're not here to recover the past. We're here to be faithful in the future. And as much as we celebrate the past, if we get into a mode of thinking, well, those were the glory days. Let me tell you something, folks. The good old days are now. And if you're not careful, the good old days will pass you up while you're staring wistfully into the past. Your children will go off and move away, go to other churches, and our doors will close while we're sitting in the wreckage thinking about what used to be. But we must have visionary leaders who are bold, who are bodacious in their thinking, and say, this is how we move forward in 2017. This is how the walls are going to be built. And they're not going to look the same as they did before. But guess what? They've got to be rebuilt. They've got to be rebuilt. Just like they don't make cars like they used to anymore, folks, let me tell you, Everything in our culture has changed. Everything in our culture has changed. And the way we relate to our culture and the way we minister has to adapt and minister where we are. Leaders assess what has been and they envision what will be. They envision what will be. 
Leaders can't live in a dream world. They must face the facts honestly. Don't you know that walking through that rubble was painful for Nehemiah? There he was. He hadn't yet told anybody else. He didn't have anybody else to really share the burden. Here he is by himself, and he's thinking, man, this is going to be a lot of work. Nehemiah's no idiot. He's not sitting there thinking, oh, this will be done tomorrow. Nehemiah knows what it's going to take. He's a wise man. And don't you know that the more he looked, I'm sure he saw places that maybe the rubble wasn't quite as bad as he expected. But he got to other places, and he saw places where it was just worse than he expected. And he's like, oh, my goodness, this is going to be so much work. We're going to have to have so much resources, so much manpower. Don't you know that? But leaders face the facts honestly. They accept what is, but they never lose sight of what God is going to do. We need to get a vision of God building His church. Let me give it specifically. We need to get a vision of God building His church at Briggs Road through us reaching our community, all ages, all races, all people groups. That is what God wants to do in every age with every church. In every generation, with every church, the ministries may look different, the work may look different, the tools may be different, the pastor may look different, but in every age... The gospel never changes, and the mission never changes, reaching all kinds of people from all kinds of races, from all kinds of backgrounds, from all kinds of ages, with the gospel of Jesus Christ through faithful ministry. That never changes. That never changes. And we must find a way to be faithful to that. Leaders developed a plan by gathering facts. What is, what has been, what will be. They internalize it. And at the proper time, they reveal it. So I want you to notice, secondly, leaders direct the people by casting vision. Casting vision is a term that's used a lot today. It's sometimes made fun of, but I like the term. It's simply leaders speaking in front of others what direction the leader is leading in. It's, just a, it's a transparency. It's transparency. It's honesty. It's saying this is the way we're going. This is what must be done. I've used this quote before. I've got a few one-liners that I'm just going to wear out because they're my favorites. So if I sound like a broken record, you know, that's okay. You'll, it'll eventually, you, you'll learn it and you'll love it too. But Adrian Rogers, one of my favorite preachers, said this. He says, anything with no head is dead and anything with two heads is a freak. And, and, and that's absolutely true. Whether you're talking about the home or whether you're talking about the church, whatever you're talking about, or whether you're talking about a business or an organization, Every ministry, every organization must have a leader. And here it was Nehemiah. <clears throat> Someone has defined leadership as the art of getting people to do what they ought to do because they want to do it. And folks, I can resonate with that completely. Getting folks to do what they ought to do because they want to do it. And that's exactly what Nehemiah was. I want to give you a principle here that kind of translates. We're looking into the Old Testament. We're looking at Nehemiah. We're looking at things that are a little different. We're not building walls here at Briggs Road. You know, it's not the Old Testament. We're not rebuilding the temple, but there are some things that carry over. And folks, I'm going to tell you, God's principles for leadership never change. And in the New Testament, God has given pastors, also called elders, to be the leadership of the church. Acts 20, verse 28. Paul tells the Ephesian elders, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to care for the church of God, which He obtained with His own blood. The word there for overseers. There's different words for pastor. There's, there's pastor, there's elder, there's overseer. They're translated differently in different translations. But they all give you a different function of what a pastor is to do. Pastor is a pastor. He shepherds. Pastor is an elder. He rules. He leads. Pastor is an overseer. He cares he cares for the spiritual needs, and he leads and administrates the flock. And folks, let me tell you, leadership must come. Leadership must come from those who God has called to be leaders. When Paul and Barnabas founded churches in Asia Minor, they appointed elders in every church. That's just another word for pastors. And notice they appointed more than one in every church. They appointed a multiplicity of elders to lead the church. Paul instructed Titus, to appoint elders in every city as I have commanded you, Titus 1.5. At the end of Paul's third missionary journey, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church, which we just read from that passage. In Jerusalem, Paul met with James and all the elders, Acts 21.18. Every ministry in the New Testament is led by leaders who serve 
together with one purpose. Jesus called His twelve disciples. And after Jesus' resurrection and ascension, they were the leaders. It, it was so important that these leaders lead that even when Judas had hanged himself and died, there were only eleven, they replaced Judas by electing Matthias to be a leader. Leadership is not optional. The church has to have leaders. The church has to have leaders. Nehemiah, however, is the pastor in this situation. He's the pastor. He's the elder. He's the overseer. He's the vision caster. And he comes home. Now, now remember, the Jews had already come home under Ezra a few decades before. So you've got Jews who are living in Jerusalem who have been there. They're like, we came back when we first came back years ago. Nehemiah was of those who had stayed in Persia. Now understand this, the Jews, some of the Jews had come home, they were already living in Jerusalem. Nehemiah had stayed in Persia until the time that God moved him to go back and to lead the people. So I want you to get a, a picture here. You've got people who've been keeping the lights on in Jerusalem, so to speak, but the walls are still broken down. They needed leadership, they needed direction. And you've got people there who are keeping the lights on in Jerusalem. And you get Nehemiah, who although he is a Jew, he has lived in Persia. And he's coming from outside and coming in to lead the people. Do you understand that? Do you understand why there might be some opposition to Nehemiah? Well, Nehemiah, we've been here the whole time. We've been here the whole time. And now you want to come in and solve all our problems. Now, that's not what most of the people said. We're going to see that. But that's what some of them said. That's also here. Why was it necessary? Because they needed a leader. They needed someone who God had put in their heart to lead them forward, to build the walls, to lead them to a new day. So Nehemiah comes in, but I want you to notice, Nehemiah did not see himself as an outsider. He saw himself as part of the people of God, which he was. We see this because, number one, he goes through the city himself. But I want you to read here with me verse 17. I want you to hear Nehemiah's words to the leaders. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Do you see that pronoun? Did anybody catch the word he used? The trouble who is in? We. Do you see the trouble we are in? Nehemiah just got there. You see the trouble we are in. How Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. There's that word again. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good, and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. Nehemiah comes in, an outsider. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? Sounds like a, sounds like a pastor from uh, Tennessee and Kentucky that comes into a new church in Columbus, Ohio, and starts to lead, doesn't it? I mean, hey, let's be honest. That's what this is. This is, this, is, this, is what, this is very similar. Now, Nehemiah is not the hero of the story. God is the hero of the story. And Pastor Ray is not the hero of Briggs Road's story. Jesus Christ is the hero of the story. But God appoints leaders, and He puts the burden of leadership on those who He calls. Nehemiah comes to this city, and he doesn't say, I have the answers, and my problem, and your problem. Nehemiah says we. Nehemiah says we. We are in this together. Nehemiah united his fortunes with the people of God and said, we are together and I am here to help and I am here to come together as one body to do what God has called us to do. It is not I and it is not you. It is we, Briggs Road. Some of you here may not know me very well yet. Some of you here may think I'm a newcomer. Some of you here may just hate the fact that I, that I wear a, a Tennessee orange cap from time to time. You may just absolutely despise that. But let me tell you something. It's no longer you and I. It's we. It is we. And it's going to be we. Let's just get used to it. Because we are a team. God has put us together. God has put us together for a purpose for His purpose, for good, to build, to work, to revitalize, to recover. We, we, we. You'll see later in chapter 5 how Nehemiah put his money 
where his mouth was. He really became part of the people and he united his fortunes with them. But I want you to see what he did here. He uses the word we. It's all about the people of God as a unity. I want you to notice five things that Nehemiah does. Now, I, I'm really big on, on, uh, on leadership, uh, process improvement, and things like this. So sometimes when I see things in the Scriptures, I have to be very careful not to be a pragmatist. But I want you to see these things, and I hope you see them from the text the way that I see them. These are very important. He comes and he calls the people of God to do the work of God. But I want you to notice Nehemiah does five things. He does them so skillfully. Number one, he presents the problem. Look here in verse 17, he says, You see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. He presents the problem. He says, this cannot remain. The people of God cannot remain in a city that is shameful. Not only were they vulnerable to their enemies, but they were a disgrace to the nations. All other the Gentile cities, the cities that worship pagan gods, had walls. They had armies. They were fortified, but the city where God's name dwelt lay in ruins. And Nehemiah said it can't be. Nehemiah presents the problem. Secondly, look, he proposes the solution. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem. So number one, the walls are burned. He says, number two, let's build the walls. He presents the problem. He proposes the solution. Thirdly, I want you to notice what he does. He predicts the outcome that we may no longer suffer derision. That we may no longer suffer derision. The purpose will be that the people of God will be fortified, the name of God will be vindicated, and that God's people won't be a laughing stock among the nations, that they will take their rightful place as the priestly nation of Israel, and God's glory will be restored. A good friend of mine has written a book on church revitalization, and I love the title of it. It's called Reclaiming Glory. Let me give you something on that. There's a, there's a tendency in, in evangelical life today. Uh, I, I don't want to overstate this. I don't want to state this because it, it, it's not a bad thing. There, there's, there's, um, there's been a revival of church planting. Matter of fact, Columbus is a North American Mission Board send city. There's church planting initiative going on here. I've got friends here who are church planters and, uh, and talk to them uh, regularly. But there has been sort of a tendency of some to emphasize church planting and de-emphasize church revitalization. Why is that? Because church plants grow faster than church revitalizations. A planted church grows faster, reaches people faster, can make decisions faster, and can change more quickly than an established church can. That's just a fact. And so some people have taken a model, well, let's just plant more churches and let the established churches die if that's their choice. And quite sadly and frankly, that's, that's happening. But a friend of mine wrote this book, Reclaiming Glory, and his whole thesis in the book is that it brings no glory to God to see churches close. What does it say to, a, to the lost world when... Church properties are boarded up and sold. What does it say to a lost world when churches who are, their foundational mission is to reach people, have run out of people to keep the lights on? That is a disgrace. That is a shame. And it brings disgrace on the name of God. Well, you're a church, but there's no supernatural power there, or you'd still be there. Well, you're a church, but there's no presence of God among you or you wouldn't have gone out of business. You're just another failed attempt at a social club. Let me tell you, it brings God no glory when churches decline, go into death, and declining, and close their doors. It brings God no glory. Nehemiah gives the purpose. He predicts the outcome. He says that we may no longer suffer derision. It's not about them, but it's about the glory of God. That God may be glorified by His people being built. Folks, I don't desire to see Briggs Road Baptist Church grow so that I can pad my resume and so that I can put my name out there or, to, or, or even just to, so that we'll be a, a booming church. I desire to see Briggs Road Baptist Church see growth and an evangelism explosion for one reason, that God may be glorified in the salvation of sinners who otherwise would spend an eternity in hell. That is our only motivation. Let us build so that we may no longer suffer derision. 
Let us build so that we may reflect the glory of God. The leader presents the problem. The leader proposes the solution. The leader predicts the outcome. But the leader points toward God. Now notice this. He says, And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good, and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. Do you remember that? In chapter 2, verse 8, The king granted Nehemiah whatever he asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. When Nehemiah was trembling before the king, and he was in there and he was afraid, and he told the king, here's what I'm going to need. I'm going to need these letters. I'm going to need these supplies. The king says, it's yours. Nehemiah went to the people and said, folks, he said, God is with me. He says, I've just got here, but God is with me. God has given us the supplies. God has given us the resources. God has given us the support from the king. We have a word from the king that we can go forward with this. You'd be surprised how many Baptist churches would still vote that down. Yeah, you think that's funny, but it's not. I, I can tell you right now of churches that have voted to, to clo- basically to close their doors because they didn't want to change, even when God had done all the work and provided them all the resources. I could tell you stories. I could tell you stories that are fresh on my mind right now. You might say nobody would do that. The children of Israel did that after they followed Moses to the promised land and God had done everything for them. He'd split the waters of the Red Sea. He'd given them manna. He performed miracle after miracle and he brought them to the promised land. He says, it's yours. I will give it to you. They they held a business meeting and somebody stood up and says, I don't think we can do it. I don't think we can afford it. We're not going to go in. God said, every one of you will die and go to hell in the wilderness and your children will go in. That's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. Folks, we must have a bold vision, and we must keep our eyes on God, and far too often we have had our mind on people. We have had our mind on others. We've had our mind on flesh. We've had our minds on what we can see, and we have forgotten to look at God who promises to build His church. We have been fearful of the naysayers. We have been fearful of those who threaten and those who gossip, and we've been fearful of those who have unregenerate hearts and claim to be members of a local church. And they oppose the mission of the church. They oppose the gospel. And we've allowed them to set the agenda for the church. And that is why churches die. Let me tell you something, folks. We operate on a democracy vote in most Baptist churches by majority rule. But sometimes majority rule can be of Satan. Sometimes it can. Because that's exactly what kept the people of Israel out of the promised land. A 10 to 2 vote. Let me tell you something. When it comes to setting the tone for the vision of the church, the reason God gives His church pastors and elders who should be meeting qualifications are that those who set the agenda for the church should not be the basest and most unspiritual people in the church, but they should be the godliest. People who are examples to others. Those are the ones who should set the agenda for the church. And it should not be an average of the most unspiritual and the most spiritual when you meet somewhere in the middle. You see, folks, God calls His godly leaders to be bold and to say, this is where we're going. That's how it works. The least spiritual people in the church do not get the privilege of setting the direction for the church. They get the privilege of sitting and learning while those who God has appointed lead and teach. The leader points toward God. The leader persuades the people. Look at this. Look at this. He said, God's hand has been on me for good. He says, the king has given everything that we need. And look at what they said. They said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. I love that. Underline that verse, saints. Underline that verse. Live that verse. They said, let us rise and build. And they strengthened their hands for the good work. These people had been sitting in Jerusalem and they knew they were a laughing stock. They knew the nations were laughing at them. They knew any moment the neighboring nations could come in and pillage them in a night because they were vulnerable. They knew they needed help. And when a man that had enough courage and trust in God came in and says, we can do it and we will do it, you know what they said? They said, thank you, God. Let's build the wall. Let's build the wall. Let me tell you, the leader presented the problem, he proposed a solution, predicted the outcome, he pointed to God, and that persuaded the people. 
He couldn't have done all that if he hadn't spent a few nights walking around Jerusalem in the dark, looking and surveying and learning and internalizing. Folks, this is the way we rebuild. This is the way we move forward. And thirdly, I want you to notice this. Leaders defy the enemy by trusting God. Look in verses 19 and 20. Now, this would be a great verse to close on, wouldn't it? Oh, man, they do the work. All right, let's go home. See you next week. But that's not where she ends. Verse 19. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, What is this thing that you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Then I replied to them, The God of heaven will make us prosper, and we his servants will arise and build. But you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. Let me tell you, folks, leadership is not for cowards. Leadership is not for cowards. The enemy responds with lies and intimidation. I'm going to give you a spoiler. Spoiler alert in the book of Nehemiah. These enemies, they threaten, they conspire, they insult, they lie, they gossip, they slander all through the book of Nehemiah, all through to the last chapter. But do you know what they don't do? They never deliver on any of it. They're a bunch of backbiters and gossipers and slanderers, and that's all they are. They're all talk, no power. They're all talk. Part of leadership is calling the devil's bluff. Part of leadership is calling the devil's bluff. And being, being courageous enough to trust God to do that. The enemy responds with lies and intimidation. They say, what are you doing? They know very well what they're doing. Nehemiah had already presented his letters from the king. And they said, are you rebelling against the king? They knew full well it's not what he was doing. They knew full well the king had given permission. But they were trying anything they can. Let me tell you some insult is the choice weapon of those who have no other. Slander is a choice weapon of those who have no other. Gossip is the choice weapon of those who have no other. Are you rebelling against them? They know good and well it's not what they're doing. They know good and well it's not what's happening. Now, it's interesting that they mention this because in Ezra 4.12, this actually was used to persuade the same king to stop the work. Ezra 4.12, they were rebuilding the city, rebuilding the temple. People had settled there. And in the book of Ezra, the same complaint. They, they went to the king and said, hey, king, these people are building. Uh, they're going to rebel. And the king shut it down. So they're, they're, kind of, they're kind of insinuating here to Nehemiah, hey, look, we've done it before. We'll get you shut down again. We've done it before. We'll get you shut down again. But Nehemiah had been on his face before God. As I said last week, when you've been before God, you can stand before men. That's a walk in the park. Nehemiah says, our God will prosper us. He says, we will build this wall. He said, but you all have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. You have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. What does that mean? It means they had no legal right to say or do anything. They were outside of bounds. This is the tactic of the devil in every generation. Acts chapter 17, when the apostles had gone preaching... And Paul and his company had been preaching the gospel. They were accused of being the ones who turned the world upside down. And the authorities said about them, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them. And they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. So the people were saying about the apostles, they've turned the world upside down. They're saying that Caesar's not king. This is the tactic of the devil, to shut the gospel down, to shut missions down, to shut revitalization down, to shut revival down, to shut reformation down, to shut Bible preaching down. That's the work of the devil. And he'll do it with any means necessary. So you have to ask yourself a question. Are you going to fear man or fear God? Nehemiah and the people, they remain committed to God's plan and inspire the enemy. Folks, here's, here's a saying that I, that I heard recently. It's very simple. It's been very dear to me in recent days. Do what's right and let God take care of the rest. 
You see, folks, when we're dealing with leadership and we're dealing with eternal souls and we're dealing with the mission of the church, we're not dealing with good ideas versus other ideas and here's a suggestion, here's an opinion. We're dealing with right and wrong. You see, when we have situations, whereas let's say hypothetically, let's say the leadership of the church said we must do X, Y, and Z, and this is a good thing, and, and the godly people of the church have prayed over this, this is a direction, but someone who's unspiritual and uh, here just uh, sporadically, and, and uh, they're, they're, not a, they're not a spiritual leader in the church, and they're, they're sort of an unspiritual person, and uh, have been known for these sorts of things, and they come forward, and and they say, well, we're you just we can't do that, and we're, we're not going to go that way, and we're not going to have that. You have to make a choice. Are you going to fear man and do what God says? A fear man and do what man says, a fear God and do what God says. When you come into those situations, though, it's not just one equal opinion to another equal opinion. It's, it's a matter of right and wrong. It's the matter of right and wrong. And it's never right to give selfish, self-centered, self-concerned people their way. I don't care if it's a little child or if it's an 80-year-old man or woman. It's never right. You do what God says. You do what's right and let God take care of the rest. You do what God says. You let God take care of the rest. I was once told, I'm not here to tell you a pity story, but I'm going to tell you something. I was once told, pastor, and I won't say where, but I was once told, not here, well, not here. I was once told another place, pastor, we're an older congregation, and um, your sermons are just too long. We can't sit that long. In the same conversation, this person told me they had recently went and watched the latest Harry Potter movie twice. <laughs> and I thought our pews were just as comfortable as the, as the seats in the movie theater, at least. And they said, Pastor, we're older. We can't sit for that long. Now, I, you know, I, I preach a little longer than maybe some, but uh, I haven't been preaching that long. Not over an hour. And they said, Pastor, we think it'd be best if you just prepared less. Well, when God calls you into the ministry, you can write my sermons. I'm just going to be plain. Folks, let me tell you something. Leadership is not set by the least spiritual people in the church. Leadership is not set by the squeakiest wheel. And sermons are not written by those who prefer them a certain way. Sermons are written by the man of God on his face in the study before God in the Word of God. Folks, we don't calibrate our church to the squeakiest wheel. And we don't calibrate our church to the loudest voices. We calibrate our church to the Word of God and we leave the results to Him. Are you going to fear man or fear God? Rebuilding the wall was God's work. The Jews were God's servants. And these men, they had no part in it. Proverbs 29.25 says, The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. Every time I've stepped out and trusted God, I've always been glad for it. But every time I've cowed out and bowed to man, I've always lived to regret it. And I've learned a lesson. I've learned a lesson. You follow God and you'll be happy for it. Acts 4, 19 through 20. When the apostles had been preaching... And they had been preaching about Jesus and the elders of Jerusalem were not happy with it. And they brought them in and said, you must not preach anymore. And they had these empty threats, you know, and these empty conspiracies. And they said, oh, you can't preach anymore. We're going to put you in jail. They answered, Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Folks, let me hear, understand this. If we begin to allow leadership to be determined by people who, who, who set the agenda low. Pretty soon I can't preach on homosexuality. Pretty soon I can't preach on abortion. Pretty soon I can't preach on race. Pretty soon I can't evangelize because that's intolerant. And if we allow the devil's voice to set the agenda for God's people, we might as well close the doors. But the mission must be set by great commission emphasis, by reaching the lost, by reaching everyone, by reaching all groups, by pursuing sanctification, by calling to repentance, 
and by having strong leadership who are not afraid of the voice of the devil. That's how we must proceed or we cannot proceed. That's how we must exist or we are not a church of God. We must be bold and we must be gospel people who have the fire of God about our presence and have, the, have not the fear of man. Fourthly and finally, I want you to notice this very quickly. Leaders deploy the people by implementing the plan. Now, Nehemiah went and he inspected the walls. He went and he cast the vision for the people. He dealt with the opposition from the enemy. And I'm not going to read chapter 3. Boy, you would really love me for that. But chapter 3 gives you a long list of people who are just building. Name after name after name after name after name. This great work of rebuilding the wall became doable when the people were mobilized by the leader. Had Nehemiah been cowed down by Sam Ballot, chapter 3 would never happen. Had Nehemiah not done his due diligence, chapter 3 would never have happened. Had Nehemiah not cast a bold vision and said, this is where we're going, chapter 3 would never have happened. But for chapter 3 to happen... For chapter 3 to happen, for Eliashib the high priest and his brothers and priests to build the sheep gate, for the sons of Hassanah to build the fish gate, for Joyada the son of Pasia and Meshulam the son of Besodea to repair the gate of Yeshana, for Hanun and the inhabitants of Zenoah to repair the valley gate, for Malchijah to repair the dung gate, for Shalom, the son of Kohazah, to repair the fountain gate. And for the priest to repair the horse gate. For all that to happen, there had to be a Nehemiah that said, here we go, here's what we're doing. And we're not going to pay attention to the words of the enemy. Mobilizing for the vision requires someone who can cast a bold vision fearlessly before God. And this is what we need a Briggs Road Baptist Church. We need a vision from God. We need a vision of what God has prioritized, and we need to prioritize that. We need a boldness that stands on what God has said in spite of what the devil might say or do. We need a boldness of God that prioritizes spiritual godly leadership over maintenance ministry that just keeps the donuts being made. <laughs> The old commercial, just making the donuts. We're not here to make the donuts. We're here to reach people for Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, today your word challenges us, but your word gives us a way forward. Lord, as we look and we see that you, we need you. We need you to do a fresh work. We need you to do a new work. We need you to build your church. We need you to help us reach our community. We cannot do it. You can do it through us. Father, we come to you today imploring Your power, imploring Your provision, Lord, and trusting You. And Lord, let us know that the fear of man is a snare, but he that trusts in the Lord is safe. And we pray that You will build Your church at Briggs Road, Heavenly Father. And we pray that You'll give us bold vision and bold leadership to be able to do what You've called us to do. And in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.